In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ Alone, a cappeldridge singing there, and uh, in Christ is where we are when we are a part of his church. And so that is our uh, kind of what our theme is right now. I'm calling this Devoted Christians. This is the second installment in that study. And I'm, I'm taking that title from Acts 2 and verse 42 in uh, some of the later translations like ESV, New American Standard, and, and, and so on in the... King James, New King James, it's continued steadfastly. Say it with me, Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Remember Hebrews 3 and verse 13. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So we spent our time in our last devotion talking about the origination of the church, how it was the church of prophecy. We looked at Daniel 2, Joel 2, Isaiah 2, and how all of that came to fruition in Acts chapter 2. Maybe that'll be an easy way for us to remember that. So as we continue, we want to talk about what it means to be devoted Christians, those who are a part of the New Testament church. I want to continue with uh, what we began yesterday. We, we saw how that fiery speech of Peter's on the day of Pentecost turned into the salvation of 3,000 souls. And so uh, that, that speech becomes a pivotal part of the New Testament. Uh, it was singularly responsible for directing the attention of that crowd to Jesus Christ as the crucified Messiah and getting them to realize their guilt and the fact that they needed to be saved from their sins. The passage that we looked at is that toward the end of Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they continued steadfastly or they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. That devotion came as a result of them being fully convicted in their hearts. They had killed the one who was responsible for their salvation. In the process, though, that sacrifice for sin was made. So I want you to notice what happens, uh, what is said right after that. Let's go back to Acts 2. Verse 43, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness, and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So we have the beginning of the church, and we have this statement in Acts 2 and verse 47 that the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, depending on your translation, uh, New American Standard, the ESV, and some later translations will probably have a note there. They, they may say something like, the Lord added to their number, or it may not say that at all. It may just have a note. And, and the thing is, in, in various manuscripts, uh, the word church may or may not be there, but it always indicates the Lord was adding. Well, where else can he add it? The church 
of Christ is the universal church that the Lord adds saved people to. It's not a building. It's not a sign. It's not a directory that you have your name in here on earth. It's a heavenly directory that the Lord knows. The Lord knows those who are his, and that is talking about the church universal, the church that the Lord adds us to. So when we are saved, the Lord adds us to the number, to the fellowship of those who are saved, to the church. Now, a a lot of people seem to to miss an important point as far as terms in the New Testament. I'm not trying to say that I'm smarter than other people or that I have some inside knowledge. I'm just saying this is something that was pointed out to me years ago that I'm thankful for, and I, I just want to share this with you. And that is that the church is also referred to as the kingdom. Now, we spent a lot of time yesterday going back and looking at Uh, For example, Daniel chapter 2, where Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the great image, and he says that that image is all about kingdoms, that it starts with the Babylonian kingdom, it it then moves into the kingdom of the the Medes and the Persians, uh, and then into the kingdom of Greece, and finally in the kingdom of Rome. And then he says there is another kingdom that will come and destroy all kingdoms, and it is that kingdom will never fall. It will never be destroyed. So that kingdom turns out to be the church. A lot of people have the idea that the Lord's going to come back and set up a kingdom here on earth. I think that comes from a misunderstanding of Scripture. If I'm wrong about that, then please prove me wrong. But regardless of that, the New Testament speaks of the church being the kingdom. In Colossians 1 and in verse 13, I want you to notice a passage there, and I want you to notice how it is worded. Notice with me there, Colossians 1 and verse 13, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now, I want you to notice again that passage with me and notice the tense of those words. Whether we spell it out or whether we take knowledge or whether we point out past, present, and future tense of words, we still understand them, don't we? If I tell you that I'm going to the store or if I tell you I went to the store, I don't have to say, now, that's past tense, do I? You know what I mean. If I'm going, that's sometimes uh, pres- that, that's sometimes future tense. It can be present tense. I'm going to the store right now, or I'm going to the store in a couple hours. But if I say I went to the store, you know that I've already done it. It's past tense, right? Well, I want you to notice again the, the tense of this. He has delivered us. Is that past, present, or future? If he's done it, it's already done. It's past. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and and conveyed us. Now, that ED on the end is a dead giveaway, isn't it? When we add, we add that to words to make them past tense, don't we? Like uh, deliver is now, but delivered is past tense. All right? So uh, it's not the only suffix that makes past tense, but it is one of them. So he has delivered us, and he has conveyed us where? Into the kingdom of the Son of his love. That's past tense. He's already done it. We've already been put in the kingdom. And how does that happen? Look at verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, uh, the blood of Jesus is what forgives our sins. We know that we must have contact with that blood in order to have our sins forgiven. This is just one of many passages that tell us about that. And uh, here we're told that it, that has already been done just as Jesus already shed his blood. He has already conveyed us into the kingdom 
Now, there is a passage uh, of Scripture in the Gospels that I want to direct your attention to now, Matthew chapter 16 and verses 18 and 19. Uh, an interesting fact that I did not even realize until this morning is that the word church only appears three times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That kind of shocked me. But a further shock is those three times all occur in the Gospel of Matthew. So if this comes up in a Bible trivia game, you'll know. <laughs> but it's more than just trivia. It is important information. Matthew 16, uh, verse 18, is one of the places it comes up, and then twice in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 17 is the only other two places the word church comes up. But notice with me Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Most of us remember this after, after Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, Jesus says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, notice there that the word church in verse 18 is synonymous with the word kingdom in verse 19. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because Daniel talked about a kingdom that would be established that would never be destroyed. And Jesus now says, I'll build my church. I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom. Those are synonymous terms in that case. And most of the time in the New Testament, the great majority of the time, church and kingdom are synonymous terms because the kingdom of Christ is where Christ dwells. You know, a kingdom has to consist of certain things. It has to have a king. It has to have territory. It has to have subjects. There are you know, various components that make up a kingdom. Well, Jesus Christ is the king, and his territory is the hearts of men, and his subjects are all those who allow Christ to dwell in their hearts and to direct their hearts, to be lord and ruler over their hearts. So it is a spiritual kingdom, just like Daniel prophesied, just like Joel talked about uh, some 800 years before Christ was born. So, how are we redeemed? By the blood of Christ, Colossians 1 and verse 14. Uh, our time is almost up, so I just want to introduce you to one other passage that talks about a third, a third uh, term that is used, another way that the church is referred to, and that's in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. If you haven't connected this with Ephesians chapter 1 in your Bible somehow, I make a lot of notes but I would encourage you to do so. Notice Ephesians 5 and verse 23. This is a neat chapter because there's a lot said here about the husband-wife relationship, but in the end, Paul says, you know, everything I've said about husbands and wives is true, but the bigger picture is this is what I'm saying about Christ and his bride, the church. Ephesians 5, 23, the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So now we have the church, the kingdom, but the church is also called the body. And the reason it's the body, it is the body of Christ. Christ is the head, and we are the body. The head directs the body. Just like our heads direct our bodies, Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and he directs his body, the body of Christ. Now, the reason I said that I want you to connect Ephesians 5 with Ephesians chapter 1 is because it really makes plain that the church of Christ is the body of Christ. Notice with me in Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23. He, that is God, has put all things under his feet, that is Jesus' feet. God has put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him, gave Jesus, to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So you see there that we have the church, the kingdom, and the body, those all referring to the same thing there, and that is what Jesus died for, what Jesus adds 
those who are saved too. So it's important, I think, to understand what all of these terms mean so that we can have a better understanding of what these people devoted themselves to. We're going to talk more about the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers as we continue the series, the Lord willing. Let's pray. Holy Father, thank you for your word, and we pray that today you'll give us a hunger and a thirst for it. Help us to want to know more about your son, about his kingdom, about his church, about his body. And as we discover it, may we be excited to be a part of it, to share it with others so that your kingdom would grow exponentially, not just here where we are, but the world over. Father, be with us today and help us to be examples of those who are a part of the kingdom. And when you're finished with us here, may we come to be with you forever is our prayer in Jesus' name. And amen. If you're not part of the body, would you please leave a comment and tell me that you would like to know more? If you are a part of the body, would you leave a comment and just say, I am pleased to be a part of the blood-bought body of Christ. Hey, everybody, have a great day. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns. So it calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand.